main reason why they come to the cooking school is because it's in the middle of a farm, because we grow a huge percentage of the food that they can cook with, they can learn how the food, literally how their food is produced from their much hackneyed phrase from the farm to the fork now. And so we do three, three month certificate courses in the year for people who want to earn their living from the cooking, some uh, lots of short courses, we do forgotten skills courses, and they could be anything from how to cure a pig in a day, how to make butter, cheese and yogurt, how to build a smoker and smoke your own food, how to anything I think my people might come to, foraging, uh, butchery, anything. And more recently, I've fulfilled an ambition of many, many years. I've, at this stage, the farm, uh, we employ over 55 people on the, on the farm and uh, at the cooking school. And there's an, a tremendous uh, array of skills, both in growing and, and preserving and fermenting and all sorts of things. And it seemed almost irresponsible to have this sort of outdoor, we use the school, we use the farm and gardens like an outdoor classroom and the school is an indoor classroom. And it's, we have, so it seemed almost irresponsible not to pass on the skills uh, that we have in the place. So this, so we, this year, um, and I planned to do it before 1983 when the whole economy collapsed, we put on a sustainable food production course. It filled in a couple of weeks was over 100% oversubscribed, and it's running concurrently with the end of the 12-week course. And these are all people in very successful careers who actually just say to themselves, hey, there has to be something more to life than this. And they want to take back control of their life. They want to learn, they want to, uh, you know, learn how food is produced. And maybe a lot of them are buying some land or they want to grow something, etc. And so that's uh, just a very intensive six-week course. And it's been Incre incredible, it's man it just shows there's a craving out there to reconnect with how food is produced and where it comes from. And here are two people who really are doing it. <laughs> so that's just a little bit of uh, background there. I don't know whether that paints any kind of picture. I think, w w w oh, I see you. No, you, you're going to- Traded places. Oh, you're yeah, traded places, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, first and foremost, I, I would like to introduce you to Bronwyn Percival. Now, Bronwyn is the head cheese buyer at Neil's Yard Dairy in London, and with the uh, protege of Randolph Hodgkinson, whom we all admire so much, who has done so much for the Irish, both Irish and British uh, farmhouse cheese. And now come and tell us your story. Tell us your story from the start. Wow, so I started working for Neil's Yard Dairy 12 years ago, having come to it from a background of studying first biochemistry as an undergraduate, and then spending two years in West Africa as a volunteer doing health education in the Peace Corps. And um, one thing led me to another, and um, I ended up working at this cheese shop. Whenever anyone asks this question, though, my husband always says, you tell them the wrong story, because the real story is about your great-grandfather and how he moved to California from Switzerland in um, in 1906 the, um, and he brought he came from a farming background and he started a small dairy in San Bernardino called Meadowbrook Dairy and it started out as a small holistic well a small farm like all farms were in those days where they had pigs and it was a dairy farm and they had orchards and it was completely self-sufficient and they were very progressive at every step of the growth of the farm they followed conventional best practice to the point where when I um, first became aware of this farm as a young kid when we went and visited my cousins um, it had over 2,000 cows and they were farming then by then in the high California desert because that is where that path of best practice and of um, of advice from all of the appropriate authorities had led them. And in fact, about 10 years ago, my uncle ended up going bankrupt and selling the farm because even with uh, 2,300 cows being milked 24 hours a day, the farm w couldn't compete with the even bigger dairies that were operating within that landscape. And so in my work now, where I work um, as the cheese buyer for the company, traveling around, Neil's Yard Dairy is a um, a mature and a selector, a wholesaler and retailer of British and Irish farmhouse cheeses. And in my job now, I work with farmers and I travel around um, uh, throughout the UK and Ireland, visiting farmers, tasting every batch of cheese that they make and selecting the batches that we want to buy for our um, company. But also I feel like a huge part of my job and more and more over time is trying to make connections between 
between farms and between farmers because there's a lot of information in silos out there that can help people learn from others' mistakes. And also um, between cheesemakers and the scientific community because as cheese changed so drastically, as dairy farming changed so drastically over the past 150 years, we lost those clusters of knowledge and expertise that, that farmhouse cheese used to have. And now our information resides at the industrial level, but farmhouse cheese makers finding their solutions from industry is not a satisfying solution. And I think that's one of the things I'm gonna be talking about today. Great. Shall and I, I mean, interestingly, um, we talked, uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, each farm, of course, has its own ecosystem and, and flora in the air and all the rest of it. And the food that comes from it is uniquely from that place. And for the local people, it's local food. But nowadays, the reality of most people's lives is that we eat, if, if you're most of your food is coming from your local supermarket and, and it can be coming from thousands and thousands of miles away from all over the world. And if one really thinks about it, a lot of, very little of the food that people eat nowadays is actually local food. Whereas years ago, you would have had your own milk, probably maybe your own eggs, your own vegetables would have come from the local area and they were carrying the antibodies of the area. And I keep wondering whether this extraordinary rise in allergies and food intolerances can be anything to do with the fact that where our systems are being challenged with foods that with, with all kinds of um, different types of bacteria in them that we, our systems, our grandparents or great grandparents systems never actually in fact encountered. So the fact that uh, this, have you any thoughts about that in terms of the the, 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 the actual value of the local bacteria in, in that food that matters. It's a very interesting question, and I think it's one that we're only beginning to begin to understand um, how these systems work, and there's still an enormous amount that we don't know. But there have been studies that have been done that show incidence of allergies um, and compare them. Yes, honey or or comparing the um, comparing the rates of allergies and asthma amongst children who grow up on dairy farms and drink the raw milk and are in that environment versus ones that live that grow up in the in the city and show that there is a dramatically demonstrable difference in in that and so maybe within my presentation we can start to understand some of the background about these microbial ecosystems at the on the farm and how they affect not only health but also flavor. Mm. So. Yeah, why not? All right, let's get started. Um, so I was really um, excited when Patrick invited me to present at this conference because I feel like even in the past few years as a cheese buyer, uh, working in the, in the world of, um, of commerce, if you will, um, I've, I feel that we're starting to undergo a revolution in the way that we understand the food that we're working with. And in a conference where we're thinking about systems and how the completeness of the system determines the success or the failure of the whole, how actually we in the marketplace, we the people who are bringing some of these agricultural products to our customers are playing potentially a very big role in the success or failure of particular farming systems and in their sustainability. So um, the, my presentation today is called Cheese Orchestrating a Three-Part Harmony. And I want to start with that idea and carry it across and see where it leads us. So I just want to step back and talk about cheese making as a practice. And I think it's important to note that cheese making, everybody thinks of cheese making as going on, it's a process that people do to milk that's in a vat. And um, it's, you know, it, there are multiple ways of getting moisture out of milk, but really we need to step back and think about cheese making as farming. Cheese making is about ecology and it's about farming on three separate scales. On the first scale, we have the macro scale. And this involves the soil, the, la uh, the land, the plant biodiversity on each farm, and the ecology of that entire system. This is where cheese starts. This is what cows are eating. This is what goats are eating. This is what goes into their milk. And it's a very important part of the aspects of that milk that it's able to have. Now so tell me, where was that photograph, that pasture taken? Is this like Transylvania or somewhere? This is one of my favorite places in the entire world. This is a picture of an upland hay meadow in the Yorkshire Dales. They're extremely fragile and rare environments, and I think they are being conserved desperately right now because only a tiny fraction of what was originally there was maintained. Yeah, if lucky, it would be the, the cattle or the cows. That they would get to eat that. That's like cow dessert, I think. <laughs> and that's how it would be if there was no grass there. 
that's why I thought it was fun for them to mm. work. Absolutely. So here, this is this is an upland hay meadow full of biodiversity. Within these environments, people measure diversity within the, by the number of species that they can find within a square meter. And they start at an aim of more than 25. You can find very old marginal upland hay meadows with greater than 70 different species a square meter. And this is truly a biodiverse um, environment. And for that environment to be maintained, it requires animals, ruminants to graze and to feed the soil with their manure. And in order, this is, this is the meso level of cheese farming. Which cows you choose to live on your land, which cows are suitable for the sort of environment that we saw earlier on. These cows here, and it's hard to tell their scale from the picture, but they're very small, compact cows. These are called original population northern dairy shorthorn cows. They're the sorts of cows that, that really first existed on this environment. They were one of the first breeds of anything, um, the first breed of cow with a herd book starting in the 1820s. And essentially, these are cows that are suitable for these very marginal environments. These are cows that are happy living on grass and nothing else. And, in, but the, and the thing that makes them so interesting is that they're suitable for that environment, and they don't need a lot of concentrates and things from outside. So that's the meso level. And that's then the breeders, a breed there list? Northern dairy shorthorn cows. Northern Exactly. And then finally, cheese making is also farming at the microbial level. And these are just some yeasts that were isolated from cheese rinds and grown on a petri dish in a lab. But he, uh, milk is host to a range of naturally occurring microbes. And cheese making, when done in a sensitive way, isn't necessarily about adding microbes from outside to a blank canvas, but rather creating an environment that can potentially draw out um, and encourage the growth of the microbes that you want. So encourage the ones that you want and discourage the microbial weeds, if you will, by your farming practices, by the way you make the cheese. So if those are the three-part harmony of making cheese, the farming that goes into the raw materials, then I would argue that perhaps cheese making itself is the melody. This is the music that we choose to play when we get in front of that vat and decide how to make, how to process this milk, how to, it, all cheeses come essentially from a couple of ingredients. You've got the milk, you've got an enzyme called rennet, which allows you to remove the moisture in, um, from it, and then you also have salt. Everything else between all cheeses, I would say all cheeses of integrity, is absolutely the same. And so based on the cheese maker's um, designs, you can turn a raw, a, a raw milk into anything from a little tiny lactic cheese to a massive comté. And what you're doing when you play this melody is essentially shaping those communities of microbes to your will and controlling this process in a way that allows the essential character of that milk to come through. And so really, I think uniquely amongst products, cheese gives you the opportunity to taste a farming system. And as we've gone, as the, as the dairy farmer has looked more and more towards just milk, liquid milk as the product of the dairy farm, liquid milk is absolutely delicious. But if you take the liquid milk that comes from a really extensively farmed, interesting farm um, with lots of biodiversity at every level and you taste it, it's going to taste pretty much milky. And if you take conventionally farmed milk, it's also going to taste pretty much milky. There's very little difference. There, there are shades of difference between the flavors of those two fresh milks. If you took those milks and turned them into cheeses, then you're allowing an entire, that entire ecosystem to be amplified and projected into something that tastes utterly unique. And you will taste the difference between those two milks very, very clearly. So, over the past 150 years, though, and I, I do not need to tell this audience this because I think this is self-evident to this group, the way we've farmed has changed, and it's been farming according to looking for yield rather than looking for biodiversity, looking for cheapness and economies of scale and yield from the land rather than extensive farming systems that protect the biodiversity of those environments. And on the left in this picture, we have a really quite a healthy but quite a modern um, artificial grassland. This is ryegrass with some clover, um, and it was taken um, from a farm where uh, cheese is made, the animals are grazed. This uses nitrogen on it to encourage um, a high, you know, a high yield of lots of growth. What that nitrogen does, though, is to encourage the leafiest, greenest, most competitive plants at the cost of, on the right-hand side, we can see a, a very marginal um, 
piece of meadow where essentially it isn't fertilized and you have a lot more um, different species that haven't been crowded out by these nitrogen loving plants. Um, there are other things that influence the yield that also have an effect on biodiversity. I just talked about nitrogen. The act of cutting silage, which is actually a really modern practice. If you look back, you know, silage didn't exist before about 1890, and yet we think of it now, particularly in wet climates like the UK, as an essential part of, um, of dairy farming, that you, you can't get enough energy off the land unless you're cutting silage. Silage allows you to cut the grass earlier because it's wetter. You're not depending on it to dry, to be able to be dry enough to make hay. Um, but in doing that, you're cutting that grass before those flowers have had a chance to go to seed and drop those seeds and repropagate those seeds in the, in the, on the land. So essentially, you might be able to get four cuts of silage in a really good year like this year, cut the, that young grass four times and quadruple the output of your field compared to, say, something like this, which is a picture taken in 1962 of one of those upland hay meadows, which at that point was being turned into hay um, by hand. They would scythe. You had to wait until, generally you have to wait until August to cut your first cut and your only cut of hay from this land until the grass has dry, dried out, until the flowers have gone to seed and dropped those seeds. And at that point, it, you can successfully make hay even in quite a marginal environment. But you get much, much energy, much, much less energy off of the same amount of land. <coughs> what you do get, however, is hay and grass that's full of compounds called terpenes. And terpenes are essentially essential oils. They are, they are produced naturally by these aromatic plants. There are not a lot of terpenes in rye grass and clover, but in these chamomile species, in the mints and, the, and all of the herbs that grow in these herbal lays, you will get terpenes, and those terpenes do pass through into the bloodstream of the animal, into the milk. And while it's difficult, while scientists have tried to show that these compounds come through and influence the flavor of the cheese, what is clear is that actually terpenes also have quite interesting antimicrobial properties. Essential oils can be antimicrobial. And that those terpenes are, uh, are actually influencing the growth of the microbes within the cheese as it ripens and affecting the flavors of the cheese in that way as well. So here is a way that we can taste biodiversity in cheese. Looking now at the meso level, the Holstein is a perfect example of an animal that's been bred to match these very high yielding intensive dairy farming systems. If you put this Holstein out on the meadows where those northern dairy shorthorns were living, it would quickly lose its body condition. It is programmed to put genetically um, genetically bred very effectively to put its energy into making milk. And if it's not eating enough energy to support its body, then it will waste away and it will not be able to be bred again within a reasonable amount of time. It's a cow that is bred to eat a lot of concentrate and a little bit of forage and to produce as efficiently as possible a large quantity of liquid milk. You can contrast this to this cow is a Welsh black with a little bit of um, Ayrshire mixed in. This is actually a cow that lives at Patrick Holden's farm. You may meet her tomorrow night um, if, you're at the, if you're at the party. Her name is uh, Grassy Tail, and I think this picture <laughs> is a really lovely illustration of this is a cow. People think of Welsh blacks now as beef cows, but actually all cows were originally multi-purpose animals that were useful for milk, low-yielding, low but milk and beef and Many of them could even be used to pull a plow in situations where that might be warranted. Grassy tail is an animal that is bred to live in an interesting place, and in doing so, she may not have the milk with the highest components, the highest fats and proteins, but in a way, it doesn't matter. We're out of a world where we're farming for yield, and we're into a world where we're farming for interest, and this is a cow that can do that. And then finally, looking at the milk level, it's important to remember that now we think of milk as a substance that we should be able to keep in its sweet form for several weeks at least, and if it starts to sour before then, there's something wrong with the way that milk was produced. But that is a historically unprecedented phenomenon. And in fact, all milk that was produced 150 years ago or even less was extremely laden naturally and unbeknownst to the people who were running these farms and making cheese with microbes, and these microbes digest the milk sugars in the milk, these lactic acid bacteria, turn the sugars into lactic acid, 
and sour that milk. And that souring is the first step, not only of making yogurt, but particularly of making cheese in the preservation of that milk, and it's a natural process. If we look back to cheese making manuals written in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, nobody ever had trouble souring their milk. They weren't using starter cultures. What they were doing was keeping the evening milk overnight, and the next morning they said, if you come in and you take the temperature just with your finger, if that milk is too warm, you are going to have problems with your acidification going too fast and you need to get a move on because your milk is going to be running away without you. This is a world that we no longer live in and that is because uh, uh, along that period of time, the dairy industry has absolutely committed itself to the annihilation of milk microbes. And the, this is a teat that has just been dipped with a, um, with a chemical called lactifense and essentially the teat skin is one of the most important reservoirs of these beneficial, useful lactic acid bacteria, as well as ripening bacteria. You know, you, people talk about um, washed drying cheeses smelling like feet. Skin bacteria are a really, really important, essential part of the microbiome of cheese rinds. And where those come from is a combination of the milker's hands, but also particularly of the teats of the cows. When they come in to be milked, there is an entire ecosystem on that teat that is set up to make cheese. And when we look to make milk that's stripped of microbes because we conflate cleanliness and sterility with safety, we end up working against our, our greatest allies in the cheese making process. A group of cheese, and I, I should add, this is not just a phenomenon that is happening in the UK and in the US, it's also happening in France. And the difference, which I think is extremely interesting, is that French scientists have started to notice this phenomenon and they're really concerned because for them, a really important part of the sustainability of their cheeses is their ability to make cheeses that are linked with an individual place and to have unique flavors of these these AOP cheeses. And they've recognized more and more over the past, even the past 30 years, the cheeses are starting to taste more and more the same. And they're starting to taste of the commercial cultures that people are adding from outside. And as a result, they've set about, with government funding, um, looking at the different reservoirs of microbes on the farm where the microbes are living, what sort of microbes they are, and what are the doors and the levers that you can pull to open the gates to some microbes rather than others. So microbes are everywhere in our environment. We know this now. It, it is becoming less and less of a terrifying concern to us that there are these microbes everywhere because as we learn more about these ecosystems, we realize their importance to our health and the characteristic um, quality of our products. They found that even within milking machines, there are biofilms of microbial communities that if you take a perfectly freshly cleaned milking machine and you pour sterilized UHT milk through it, and then you leave that milk in a jar in a warm place, it will sour. That there are organisms even within our clean equipment that are helping us make cheese and that are inoculating them. At the same time, some milking machines are full of spoilage biofilms, and if you pour that same milk through it, you'll get milk that goes rancid and horribly bitter in a short period of time. These are things that nobody is looking at or asking about right now, and these are the sources that we have to control the quality of our milk at a level that we haven't even dreamt of. Um, I think one brilliant example of a way that farmers working without really sophisticated equipment are in a position to really influence for the better their milk microbial balance is the use of a really old technique which is using wood wool or wood shavings on the udders of their cows when they're milking to clean them instead of chemicals like that lactifense that you just saw. Of course, if your cow has just come into the parlor having laid down in a cow pat, you're going to want to resort to more than a little scrub with a bit of dry wood wool. But if your cows are living in a very spread out place outside, you know, at the time they're milking them, if they're coming into the parlor clean, you don't have to be splashing around a lot of chemicals to get a clean milk and a clean teat. And a, and a method like this actually is something that Nick Millard, the herdsman at Holden Farm Dairy, has implemented for all of their cows. So now um, they use no chemicals either before or after in their milking parlor, and they're making raw milk cheese very happily with this. Only wood wool to clean the udder and send the cows on their way after the milking is done. So I think the it's important to remember that the the world that we live in in dairy farming now is a modern, a modern convention. And not so long ago, all cheese was made on farms 
using these low yielding and very di biodiverse farming systems. Here's a picture of one of them. This picture was taken in 1915. Again, it's a Dale's cheese. This is Cutherston. And this is a cheese making room. There, the vats where they were making the cheese are on the right hand side. You've got the cheese making um, shelves in the back, making one cheese a day, just a few cows. These were cheeses of place made on single farms, and these cheeses had enormous value in London. They were rare, they were precious. Not many of them made it down there, but you, you read accounts from the 1920s, from the 1930s, of these Dale-style cheeses being the most precious and most the, the ones that the gourmands were really looking for because they were so unique and lovely and subtle and special. Unfortunately, our system has been very good at eliminating those types of farming systems. And I love this, I love this table because it really shows 1939 was fairly late in the game. By then, the farmhouse cheese industry had already begun to decline rapidly in the face of a demand for liquid milk and um, the expediency of selling milk directly fresh from the farm rather than processing it on site. So as you can see, in 1939, there were, th there were only 333 cheddar makers on farms in Somerset. In 2017, there are three. Wensleydale, 176. 2017, one. And Stilton, which I think is an interesting one, in 1939, there were zero farmhouse Stilton cheesemakers left. They had the last farmhouse cheesemaker making Stilton stopped making cheese in 1935. We are at the um, end point of a very long decline in the profitability, in the sustainability of making cheese on farms. Um, and that's in the face of what on the surface looks like a real renaissance of farmhouse cheese making. This is our cheese counter at Neil's Yard Dairy in London uh, in our Covent Garden shop and we take great pride in the fact that all of our cheeses come from the British Isles. And we have since when Randolph um, my boss began um, working with Neil's Yard, Dairy, working at Neil's Yard Dairy, and made it into a company that was there to really support the revalorization and the regrowth of the British farmhouse cheese culture. Back in 1979, there was almost no farmhouse cheese making left, and certainly those few remaining farmhouse cheese makers were on the cusp of throwing in the towel. It was not a sustainable business for them. Today, we see many, many more people going into the business of making cheese. And it's very interesting that uh, the talk around farmhouse cheese is very positive now. You see that this has become a way for small farmers who are making commodity liquid milk, which is absolutely the road to oblivion, see this as a way of adding value to their milk. And that is really, really important. But I would maybe perhaps argue that this revolution has only been skin deep and that we have been very good at starting a conversation about farmhouse cheese making that concentrates on what happens in the vat rather than what's going on at the farm. And so we, I, every week, I get contacted by people who are either starting to make cheese or they're already making cheese, and they send me samples that look like this. Mm. And this cheese, if you look at it, this cheese is the cheese equivalent of an Iowa cornfield. You've got a monoculture rind, and you've got a stabilized paste, and I guarantee you that this cheese is not going to taste interesting. And the sad thing about this is we can ask ourselves, is this made from interesting milk, and does this person have an admirable farming system? And the truth is, based on the way this cheese is made, it is absolutely impossible to tell. The cheese making itself is perhaps not sufficient to turn, cheese making is not going to turn commodity milk without any character into a good product, but it can also get in the way of the expression of very interesting milk. And what we need to be doing as a community, as a, as a, as a buyer and as a seller and as a community of customers, is starting to ask questions about how farming is done and how we can taste the flavors of good farming in the cheese as focused through by good cheese making. So I wanted to just show a couple of examples where farms, I think, are getting real value from real farming. And so this is one case study that we have. This is Slate Farm in Somerset. Mary Holbrook has been farming um, goats on her husband's land for about 30 years now. It's extremely extensive. 
She, um, she, the goats graze outside during the summer. It's only seasonal production. She does not make silage. She never puts down nitrogen, and her fields haven't been plowed in over 30 years. When I was walking with her on the farm last summer, um, I just, um, as we were walking through the fields, I picked this incredible bouquet of wildflowers from her, from her yard, and it, it's amazing. And you can taste in her cheese where she uses only whey starters, so essentially no commercial inoculants whatsoever. This is a cheese that she makes called Old Ford. It's absolutely brilliant. It has the most intense, long, floral flavor of any cheese that we sell. And this is, this is an amazing cheese. And she makes amazing cheese. Um, this is the opportunity to taste her farming system in a solid object that we can uh, eat in London or we can eat next door to her farm at her local village store. Um, here's another example. This is, you may recognize those cows because I just showed them to you before. This is a very new project. They're not even making cheese commercially right now, but Andrew Hatton is a farmer based in North Yorkshire who's looking to revive small holding Wensleydale production on a tiny farm using original population cows. These cows are going to give about 1,800 liters of milk a year. That's about a fifth of the amount than a normal Holstein cow would give. On the bright side, they can eat entirely from what that farm is producing. And he's making cheese now, really ramping back the level of inoculated starter cultures and going back, interviewing old, old women from the area who made Wensleydale in their youth and trying to work his way back to an authentic Wensleydale like somebody might have written about in glowing terms in 1935. This is an incredibly exciting project and it combines farming sustainability with flavor. The two things that both of these farms share in common, though, is that they're quite economically tenuous. And I think it's really important to remember that sustainability also needs to encompass economic security. Mary Holbrook makes some of the UK's best cheese. She gets audited quite often because the government tax collectors cannot understand why anybody would be running a business where they make absolutely no profit whatsoever. <laughs> she does it for kicks and because I think it, at age 75 it's keeping her alive to be busy and running around and running this farm. But when she dies, that farm is probably going to get sold to somebody who's going to cover it with nitrogen and destroy this incredible ecosystem that's been developed there. Possibly, you know, th that ecosystem developed unconsciously. Mary was not setting out for biodiversity, but she has achieved it and it's so delicate and fragile. And that, that dairy is that's not economically sustainable right now in a way that somebody else is going to carry on. Likewise, the Hattons, as they're looking into creating Low Riggs Farm, where they're going to make this Wensleydale, they presented at the Science of Artisan Cheese Conference last year to a group of cheesemakers their idea for how this new tiny farm making just three or four tons of cheese a year just from their own labor using biodiverse fields and old, rare, like it's critically endangered cows. It's going to make this cheese. And I've tried his cheeses and they are astonishing. They're so incredibly different than any cheese I've ever tried. And he said, you know, we've done the numbers and in order to sell this cheese, we're going to have to charge wholesale 20 pounds a kilo. And this is going to put it on the counter in London at probably about 50 to 60 pounds a kilo. And all of those cheesemakers said, well, you're going to have to run a B&B &B as well then. The fact is that farming as it is right now and the market as it is right now is not set up and prepared to pay the real price of truly laudable and sustainable farming practice and cheese making. So we're in a system where ultimately I think right now real cheese is too much of a bargain. And likewise, many so-called artisan cheeses are not delivering the uniqueness that they should if they're truly going to be artisan cheeses. And so I would argue that this isn't really a system that's, this isn't a system that's yet in harmony. But I think that it can be, and I don't want to come across sounding really negative because I think there, it, it, that ultimately where we are is a situation that's much more hopeful than it was when Randolph started Mealshire mm -hmm. Dairy 37 years ago. That essentially, cheese making has been brought back from the brink, but we haven't taken that next step to associate farming with flavor and to reward cheese makers, not for the fact that they're just doing things on a small scale, because if all you're doing is 
telling a pretty story and making something on a small scale and you're trying to convince a customer long term that they should be buying your cheese, which tastes exactly the same as a factory cheese at three times the price, that's not a compelling offer. But what there is encompassed within these farming systems the capacity to make something that truly tastes different and that no factory cheese is ever, ever going to be able to replicate. And I wanted to bring it back around to perhaps a harmony, a harmony circle, a holistic system that's not yet been complete, but I think that together we could play an important role in bringing it back around. And just to talk you through this, it's associating these things that we associate with good farm management, like pasture species diversity and farm microbial diversity, which I've just talked about, which then lead to interesting animal feed composition and milk microbial composition to a raw material that's absolutely full of potential. And then we need cheese making that instead of blitzing it with commercial cultures brought in from Denmark or from the United States, steps back and makes cheese that allows that potential to shine through, that makes cheese that's sensitive and it, that reveals the value of the raw milk rather than adding value to the raw milk, if you want to put it that way. And that is going to come across in the taste of the cheese that can't be achieved in any other way. And then here's the part that we have to play as, as sellers and as consumers is actually rewarding those unique flavors with economic viability, with the price that they truly deserve, and knowing that that money is going straight back to the farmers to put back into their farm management practices and into the land. And that, indeed, is going to be a system in harmony, and I truly believe that this holds the potential not only to maintain the number of small farm cheesemakers that we have today, but to greatly increase them and increase the market for their cheese and make farmhouse cheesemaking truly sustainable. Reminds me for that years ago, uh, at the beginning of the revival of the farmhouse cheese industry in Ireland, again in the 70s, uh, we had a young French couple who'd moved to West Cork from France, and uh, they had uh, came from a farming background. They naturally made cheese from the milk of their cows, and they used no uh, starters, both starters at all, but just as they would have done at home, just literally a bit like making sourdough, harnessing the floor and the air and so on. They brought their cheeses to Cork to the market. They asked, of course, where to sell them and there was no market, farmer's market system in Ireland at that time, but they brought them to the English market in Cork, as we call it, and had a little stall there and sold it. And um, their cheeses were amazing. They were, uh, you would have loved them. They were totally different every week. You could never say to somebody, go and get a bit of the something that you got last week because it would be different or certainly within the season. But of course, the EHOs, the environmental health officers, as soon as they found them were absolutely spooked. They absolutely could not get their heads around um, just making cheese in this way. Um, you know, why weren't they using the bought starters and all the rest? In the end, they hassled them so much that they actually went back to France. And we were so heartbroken and they had such a following. And, but so much was lost, uh, particularly off, just after we went into the EU with these regulations that were totally out of proportion to any kind of risk involved and actually very often brought in and implemented by people who had very little understanding of the process. And uh, th so that was a, a very big tragedy because what we should have been doing is down on our knees actually learning from them and learning the traditions, but uh, too late now. But actually there is still a huge paranoia around among the general public about raw milk uh, and indeed raw milk cheese as well. Um, where, uh, and, and the, where do you stand on this? <laughs> I think it's an extremely, extremely pertinent question because of course, for environmental health officers and for many people who have been, you know, steeped in the language of raw milk being inherently dangerous, the idea of then taking that raw milk and exponentially increasing the number of all those naturally occurring raw milk microbes sounds absolutely terrifying. And I think this is one of the places where actually we can rely on, where we can benefit from two things. The first one is the fact that I think we are in the process of learning a lot more about microbes as not our foes, but our friends, and that as we learn more about the role of healthy microbial communities in our health and in our environment, that slowly 
these attitudes towards microbes as contagion are going to be broken down. That instead of demanding antibiotics when they take their kids to the, ho to the doctors for a cough, people will be really hoping that they can get away with not giving them antibiotics. That's the first step in changing the cultural idea of you know, the fear surrounding raw milk. But the truth is that the other thing is, this isn't about relinquishing control at all. This is about gaining finer control, but not the kind of control that you get by wiping everything out and then adding it back note by note, but by understanding how these communities behave and by very proactively opening the door to the good ones and shutting the door to the bad ones. It's not about making milk dirtier, and we haven't forsaken any of our modern methods of analysis, of micro-testing, of all of the parts of our risk analysis and assessment plans. Those are an integral part of making cheese in this way. And so we're not throwing out responsibility or responsible systems. We're co-opting those systems as part of best practice to actually open the door for us to push the limits in ways that are completely safe, but which also allow us to access the value of our raw materials. Trusting in nature, because let's face it, how long have they been making cheese? And nowadays, um, in many dairies and, and so on, people could, you could almost eat your dinner off the floor. It's quite different <laughs> environment. And it's in a way to trust nature and trust the way it, the equilibrium that develops. But that's, uh, uh, that's a big ask for some people. So I will take one question, then we'll... I think it's, it's absolutely a great question, and we have to find ways to talk with our regulators that don't put their backs up, but actually get them to trust us because we know what we're doing. And I would say there are, two, there are two parts to that. The first thing is, if you're interested in making cheese, the industry body for cheesemakers in the UK, the Specialist Cheesemakers Association, is absolutely a font of information about best practice. If you join it, they will send you a code of the best practice, which is written in a way that is very open-minded. You, you have to look at your risks, you have to minimize them, you have to show that you're controlling them, but it's, it talks a lot about own made starters, it talks about wooden boards, it talks about a lot of things that don't necessarily fit in with a regulator's implicit view of the world. And if we now have something called the primary authority, which I think is a really fantastic thing because it means not all regulators are going to have, not all EHOs are going to have the same attitude towards raw milk cheese. And we've had people that we work with who want to start making raw milk cheese and their environmental health inspectors say, you can't do that, not on my watch. And so in case of disputes, the legal standing is with the assured code of practice that has been published with reasonable best practice in it and it can be appealed. So there are routes to doing that. Um, but I think, I think ultimately it is about, about looking at systems, building strong risk assessment plans. And the nice thing about cheese as opposed to raw milk is that it gives you time to test it. It gives you time to check your work before it goes out on the market. And the truth is about pathogens in cheese as well, it's not like they're never there and then they suddenly pop up one day and cause a big problem. If there are problems with a milk supply, you're going to find them and you're going to be able to put them right. And that's really the key is controlling at every step. Well, now I think thank you so much for that. Now we'll, and we can take more questions later. But now I want to introduce you to Iktid. <laughs> and um, Iktid is a charcutier. And uh, he owns Charcutier Limited, it's a special meat processing business and it supplies food halls like Fortnum and Mason and Harrods. And he's considered to be the best food producer uh, in the UK by BBC Food and Farming Awards. And of course, also he's a Nutfield scho farming scholar and a founding member of Cultivate and co-founder of Cellular Agriculture Limited. And you came and visited us in Ireland when you're on your Nutfield scholarship and so on, and also spent some time with Fingal Ferguson, who's one of our leading lights in the charcuterie. But I was very interested to read actually here that normally when we think of charcuterie and so on, we think of the, the traditions of you know French charcuterie or Italian or Polish or German or whatever, uh, and the air dried specialties, the hams and so on. But you uh, saying there was a long tradition of making charcuterie and cured meats, at least, in the UK. And so tell us about that. Uh, absolutely. Well, when I tend to, to think as, of the word charcuterie in its French sense, where it's, it's the processing of the meat into other things. So products that, that we think of as being 
sort of quite quite modest British things like like faggots or, or like pudding or pork pies. They all fall within that that tradition. So and the hams yeah. and the hams, and the hams patties, terrines, yeah. sausages, bacon, all yeah. those things that are. Uh, intrinsically British fall within that that charcuterie tradition. So, and especially if we think of, of sort of regionally, there, there's a there's a, a strong ham tradition for us here in Carmarthenshire. So now I'm not being scarred. <laughs> Are you the only one that's gone into charcuterie or not? This is an unusual departure and, and fortunate for all of us. That's actually a very good question. I, I'm not aware of any of the other producers in the UK that are actually Nuffield scholars. Yes. They're quite interesting. There's quite a few people here who are scholar, Nuffield scholars. Yes. Uh, you can usually spot each other from the ties that we wear. <laughs> which sort of like feels like some kind of secret club. Um, but yeah, no, no, I, I probably am. I mean, we're, we're a diverse group of scholars every year. Um, actually, if if I don't know if anybody knows what the Nuffield Farming Scholarship is, maybe I should maybe, maybe we should explain what it yeah. is. So, um, so Lord Nuffield started the Austin Motor Company, and uh, the the way he he did that was he travelled to to the states and, and met with Ford and, and saw the production line and brought those ideas back. Back here to the UK and and um, and started Austin. Um, his his father was a farm labourer and he really felt that farming had contributed to his life. And one of the things that he wanted to do was was kind of give something back to the industry. So in 1947, he set up uh, the Nuffield Farming Scholarship Trust uh, and sent three dairy farmers to the USA for six months to study dairying. And since then, the the, the the scholarship trust has been sending scholars out into the world. Uh, to bring back knowledge of, sort of best practice within the agricultural industry back to the UK in order to share those sort of responses with, with um, farmers here. Now, I'm a 2015 scholar, and um, I can't remember quite many. There was, there was 75, I think, of us from 14 different countries that were scholars that year. So we've grown as an organization globally. Um, and now we're expected to travel for a minimum of eight weeks across the world. And um, and it, it's really quite it's it largely it's personal development. Even though you have a topic that that, that you're looking at, mine was specifically pigs. Um, generally, you just see things from different countries that that, that you visit that that broaden your your horizons and and, and and contribute to your businesses, but also contribute to your to your own personal life. And um, and I guess I probably wouldn't be sat here if if it wasn't for my Nuffield, because uh, while I was at Ballymaloo, I actually met Patrick. And even though we in we inhabit the same um, sort of circle here within within sort of sustainable farming in West Wales. I knew knew of him, but I never actually met him. So um, it was after one of the sessions there that, that we that yeah that, that I actually got talking to Patrick. Great. Yeah. And so now, what what tell us how you how you got started and your journey because it's a really interesting. One. Yeah, well, I I probably I'll I'll start with the yeah. presentation because it's yeah. it's um I I've, I've kind of I talk about myself in it so because it's it's partly really, partly really about the story of of our business and our family so. So um, our, I'm from a farming family, and we've, we've farmed in the same valley uh, for well over 300 years since parish records uh, exist. Um, and, and our business, and, and um, well, I guess actually really the, our heritage as a farming family is probably quite common here in Carmarthenshire. We've, in addition to producing sort of agricultural product to sell at market, we actually produce for our own table. And, and that, that heritage is, is sort of very similar to sort of that relatively common um, period uh, uh, once a year where, where you have a harvest. Uh, for us specifically, it was livestock. Um, and that's one thing, actually, I, I, I did experience quite considerably on my Nuffield study was traveling and seeing how that harvest uh, works across the world and that commonality from, from, from one country to the next, whether it's in Spain or uh, in China, uh, in, in Brazil, uh, and even with sort of the indigenous peoples, like the native peoples in, in, uh, in North America. And f for us, it was it's a real family tradition, you know, the production, the, the, the killing on farm, uh, the, the, so the, the communal you say thing. You harvest, you're, you're talking about harvesting the pigs. I am, yeah, sorry, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a kinder word than, than the using slaughter or, or kill. Yeah. People tend to, <laughs> tend to not feel as warm and fuzzy when you use those words. Um, <laughs> but, it but it's been part of the farming year for uh, many, many farming families in, in Britain and in Ireland. You know, even in villages and towns, people would have, a lot of people would have reared a couple of pigs, and then in the autumn they would have the they would have had them slaughtered, and the neighbours would come around whether they would help to get kill the pig, and you'd share the, the pork and the bacon. And all that. Absolutely, I mean that, that that was my personal family tradition. That was that, that was how I was brought up. It was mm -hmm. it was about friends and family, neighbours, and and there was a huge level of respect because 
you're killing an animal, but you're trying to use every single piece of that animal because you've, you've raised it and that's your food for the year. And the process of you know utilizing the, the blood to make fresh blood black puddings, uh, the pluck to make faggots, the head to make brawn, as well as the, the slightly more common things of making sides of bacon and hams and sausages yeah. and so on. So, so that's where I kind of started as a, um, in terms of the, kind of an, an idea for, for me as a business, uh, really. Uh, and we have a little bit of, of, of history within the family in terms of uh, the, that kind of production commercially. My great aunt Ethel, um, Mrs. Evans, had a stall on Carmarthen Market. And uh, she used to produce faggots and brawn seasonally, only in the, the months when there was an R in the months, so the cold months. And she didn't drive, so uh, she used to take the bus to the market with all her produce, and a very patient bus driver would, would help her carry all her goods onto the bus and take everything off at the other end. Uh, and she's sort of quite, quite a, a local character. And, and I guess it kind of it fascinates me, this, this kind of... Um, uh, th this culture, you know, in, in terms of, and it's a food culture that surrounds sort of farming families. It still exists very strongly in, in, in pockets in, in, in this area. And in, 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 in thinking about sort of the, the subject of harmony and, um, uh, and, and putting this presentation together, uh, I was looking at this map, and um, th this shows, well, actually, there's three farms on here that, that have been ours over the years. So we started off in Kittir, which is the, at the at the top, and then we moved to Pentlandteg, and we now live in Vellinaglin, which is the bottom. And right in the middle of the, the map, uh, so this map states from the late Victorian period, uh, it says Coideglin. So Coideglin features in a series of uh, 12th century writings called the Mabinogion. And I've got a, a brief little piece that I'll, I'll read out to you. I've actually got the old Welsh 12th century here, but I've got a, a translation for you to read while I read this Welsh one. So, uh, sorry? Oh, I'm going to read it in Welsh, so you're going to have to do the, the work yourself to read. Arglwy de Begwydion, mi glywais dy fod i'r de rhyw yn anifeiliad na ddaeth i'r ynys hon i'r oedd yr blaen. Beth yw ei henw? Hoboi Arglwydd, pa fath anifeiliad ydynt? Anifeiliad bychain, gwell eich hyd na chigeidion. Y mae gohanol enwau arnynt, moch gelwyr hwy eithau. Hwy pianw? Pryderi fab hwyll, and fonwyd hwy iddo o anun gan arawn frenun anun. So, if you're wondering why sort of that, that's of, of real importance to our farm, well, anun, which is the underworld in the Mabinogion, it, it isn't really like hell, it's just an alternative world. If I stand at the back doorstep of our house and look to the other side of the valley, we have Money of Pembrae, so Pembrae Mountain, and at the top of the mountain, apparently, is where the entrance to the underworld used to be. So it's a lovely little story that, that joins in nicely, not, not, not just for the fact that Coy de Glynn also featured in another one of the Arthurian stories within the, the Mabinogion, but that pork apparently came to this world uh, from, from this hill across, across the way from us. <laughs> so in terms of, uh, although we farmed for, for generations, uh, we, we were actually a, a very traditional mixed farm and we were a dairy farm until about 1996. Uh, when I take, took over the farm in 2004, I was looking for something to, to diversify the farm business. And so in 2011, I made the decision to establish a charcuterie business. And it, it was born of that tradition, that, that, that communal experience of harvesting in, in autumn and winter. Um, and, and so I, I took a, a number of things for granted, really, in terms of starting that business. And we, we took the pedigree Welsh pig, which was the mainstay, which is now the mainstay of our production, but it, it was a traditional pig that had, had always existed in Wales as, since records had, uh, had existed. Um, and we, we kept that as, as the pig for, for our production. H hadn't really done any research on it, just thought, well, that's the pig that we've always had. It makes sense for us to, to, to keep on with it. And our, our business has been sort of a, had a, kind of a relatively steep um, rise, and we've been very fortunate to win the, uh, the BBC Food and Farming Award last year for the best producer in the UK. And, but I, I really think that the, the reason, uh, people often ask, you know, what did you win it for? What product was it? And um, generally, I, it, 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 I'm hoping that it's more to do with uh, the approach that we have as a business, and, so, and, and it's the merits of the, those approach that have contributed to, to, to having those su successes. So if we think of the pedigree Welsh pig, we're breed-specific, but we're also line-specific within, within the breed. We're feed-specific, and we have a specific husbandry system. Now... The traditional rearing system that you use is, is a mixture of extensive uh, outdoor and indoor because there are a couple of little factors, and that was actually quite interesting in, in what Brandon and we were 
was talking about in in um, in, 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 her, in her talk that you know the, the, there are systems that have existed for a very long time and 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 some of the more modern systems that, that have a label don't necessarily fit what we do. It doesn't fit our farm and doesn't fit the farmers and the people that supply us either. So you have to look at a farm by farm basis and, 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 and find a system that really works. So there's thought that goes into it, but it's very, very difficult to talk to a consumer and actually explain that in, in a very succinct and quick way. So one of the key things as well within our system is the, the use of uh, very traditional feedstuffs. So we use uh, waste co-products in the food industry um, as part of the ration. So waste, waste co-products. So co co co-products. Co so way way co 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 yeah. co 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 products. Co co yeah, I guess that's the official word for for waste. Oh, whey, brewers waste, oh, uh, vegetables, that. bread. We use pizza dough, um, waste beer, anything we can get hold of. You know, it's it's um, it, it's it's a laborious process to kind of manage that 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 collection of waste. And people, of course, years ago always used to fe feed. Um, the scraps to pigs and so on. Yeah. Yep. So in, in 2013, um, while I was still sort of developing the business, I actually took another job as a consultant project manager for the Pedigree Welsh Pig Society. We'd had some funding from Welsh Government uh, to, to look at a uh, European funded project to, to look at retaining uh, the, the genetics within the Pedigree Welsh breed to see how we could actually um, save the breed from, from its, its sort of shrinking. It, it, during the 1980s, it reduced down to, to 80 breeding animals. Um, we're, we're now in a much sort of healthier place with around 750 uh, sows. Um, but the idea was to, to, to try and limit that, that shrinkage, but also to, a ways of, 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 t of looking at the, the breed itself in a more scientific way uh, and looking at ways of marketing that, that, that animal. So uh, in, in the heyday of its production, there, there were around 50,000 Welsh pigs uh, in the 1950s. It's something that's such a huge decline from then to now. Um, but at that time, it was seen as one of the three main um, uh, efficient breeds, along with the land race and the large white. And it actually forms the basis from uh, the perspective of hybrid breeding that the, those three breeds were the three that, that we, we hybridized to produce modern pork. Uh, but in doing that, 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 it fell by the wayside during the 1980s. Uh, and, and that really is why there's been a steep decline. And that's true of all the, the, the pedigree breeds that we have, native breeds that we have within the UK. So being tasked with it, the, sort of reversing this decline, um, we kind of split the project into two things. Like, uh, the hard science part, which is looking at the genetics of the breed, DNA mapping, uh, and, and looking at the kind of more basic feed trial, feed trial aspect um, and the efficiency of the breed. And also sort of some more of the sort of softer science, the sort of social sciences. And one of the key targets that we had uh, as, a, as a group was to gain an European protected food name. And specifically, we, we realized we didn't want something that was ge geographic in the way that PGI Welsh beef or PGI Welsh lamb is. We wanted something that was broader and had sort of considerably more, more meaning. And we decided to, to apply for a traditional speciality guaranteed, which actually looks at, at a traditional system. So the, the, the name that we secured earlier this year was, is, is now called uh, tr traditionally reared pedigree Welsh pork. So, so what, what does that actually mean? You know, how do you quantify tradition or heritage uh, onto paper in a structured system? So we actually find a few things quite relatively easy, you know, so feed, husbandry, uh, welfare were actually relatively th easy things to do. So we looked back at that tradition of, of, of using the waste mm -hmm. um, because that's where really the, the growth in, in, in the Welsh pig would come from. It was using waste from the dairy industry in cheese production and also from the brewing industry. Um, so so in, in putting a, a specification together for, for feed, it was relatively easy. It, it was trying to look for locally sourced uh, feedstuffs, mainly barley and wheat, um, and looking for alternatives to soya and using... Um, looking for proteins that, that have slower growth, so not looking for the intensive quick growth, but the slower growth that would actually provide you a better flavor. So, <laughs> one of the other additional things in terms of the feed was to look at the tradition of panage or the common of mass. That was another extremely traditional thing where pigs would be taken by a swine herd out in the autumn period into the woods. 
to, to eat the mast and the, the, the fallen acorns, the, feet, the fallen beech, uh, and any sort of um, any fallen fruits that are on the ground, and that would add to that distinctiveness of that, that that product. And within that tradition, in the same way that we still have within in Spain with with the acorn-fed pigs, it was to do with seasonality of, of when those acorns would fall in order for the pigs to eat them to have the quality of the final pork based on that. So it, it, we, we, that was part of what we were trying to encapsulate. But also a few things that we, 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 um, we learned along the way, and, and we, we learned this in our business as well. When it came to things like welfare, um, we'd been pH testing every, every carcass that came into our facility. And by pH testing, you actually see what the, the stress levels are of every animal. So you can actually determine by looking at the carcass and looking at the readings, whether that stress comes from st feed stress during the life or whether it comes from stress at the point of slaughter or, or even stress during the, that, that period of, of transportation by, by just seeing where, where those levels are. And we realized that pigs that we had within a free range system that had been free range their whole lives that were f for the first time ever seeing concrete or, or the, the steel of the trailer or gates at the point of slaughter were highly stressed. And so even though they've had an amazing life, that we were actually falling short, really, at that, that final hurdle. So one thing that we'd instigated in, in our own business at that point was putting pigs indoors over the last eight weeks of their lives so that they'd, they'd get used to concrete and gates and straw, and, and they kind of, they calmed down. And they, they, weren't, they weren't as stressed. They, they were easy to load into trailers. And, and the results were astonishing when we started looking at the pH testing of, of pretty much zero stress at the point of slaughter. Now, obviously... This is where we differ when it comes to, to, to farmers' trees production. The ideal for us would to be able to kill on farm, but it's in a, where we'd have no stress at all. But, but the reality is, is we, we just can't do that. So it's one of those limiting factors. So, so in, in addition to that kind of aspect of looking at, at, at that, that system in which to rear, we also looked at uh, some of that, that harder science and trying to understand um, the carcass eating quality, um, the, the, you know, the effects on the, 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 the composition of the carcass, um, and in, in doing that, we, we utilised a, sort of a, a range of different uh, universities in South Wales and South West uh, to, to look at the yields from the carcass, to look at the, the using trained panels of people that are used to tasting, to, to, to have sort of consumer tasting panels and also trained taste panels to understand and quantify words that we can actually use when describing pork. Because if you ask a pork producer, you know, what's the best pork, they'll instantly tell you that this is the best and that it tastes like this and that and the other. So we actually needed, in order to be able to apply for this, we needed to understand how we could quantify the words. And the words that actually came out, the, the main word that came out for pedigree Welsh pork was delicate. That it has a delicate pork, pork flavour. So that's something I can actually now just go and, and market as a thing because we've had sufficient people taste it that have been trained to taste, to taste pork to actually be able to, to, to market it in that way. Which is really interesting for me because we, so looking back at our, our group of breeders and seeing what, what they what they had in their various marketing materials, a lot of it was wrong. You know, a lot of it differed greatly from actually having a lot of people quantify what something tastes like. Uh, in addition to that, we, we also looked at uh, the nutri nutritional and chemical testing. And, and this was interesting. In the, the, the earlier session that was here this morning, talking about the nutritional quality of food, um, what, what we actually found, which was staggering, was when comparing to a hybrid carcass, the pedigree Welsh carcass was 20% more nutritional in its uh, uh, in per, per hundred grams, yeah. so it's 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 really quite astonishing that that the food that we're producing it might be slower growing and might be might be more intensive in terms of the amount of food that we, we need to convert to produce the same kilo of pork, but actually when it comes to eating, it's twenty percent more. Nutritious. So so it's a huge step for us to understand that. So we were sort of very very fortunate this year to actually secure that, but we're we're now at the point where Gosh, we've done three years of work of doing all this testing and all this, this sort of iterations of things that we sent back and forth to Europe. But what do we do with it? And can we find a premium for it? Can we actually get our message and our story in a much more succinct, less rambling way than I've just, just done it to you and, and actually get it out there? So um, the, the pig as well is part of uh, the, the slow food movement's arc of taste. And the next step really for us is we've, we've put an application in for, to the to slow food movement for... Uh, for the, the Welsh pig to be a Presidia product. And what that actually means is it's not just specifically about the pig and the products of the pig, but it's about the communities that surrounds that animal. So it's about the farmers, it's about the processors, it's about the chefs, it's about all those people that, that are linked with that product. 
So it, it's about story. It's about selling that story and getting that, that sort of translating that story over to, to, the, to, to the consumer. And that's about me. Yeah, but what do you make of your cake? <laughs> um, <laughs> So we, Fantastic story, we yeah, really no, lots of different yeah 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 oh well, I, I I came yeah I guess I, I came just to talk more about about that system and and, and what surrounds it but but for, for us as a business uh, for us as a business we we we, get, we actually we have a, a breadth of, of things we I think when we we started we we always wanted to produce air dried hams yeah our, our family tradition the thing that I was always just a also think was, was kind of the sort of queen product within everything that we made. It was the hams that we produced. And traveled to, to Parma one, one September. Um, they, they, they have this three-day three event called Open Doors. And I recommend, anybody who's into ham, I recommend going because it's, it's really fascinating. You, you get onto a bus in the, in the village of Langarano and you've got no idea where you're going. And they take you to three or four places. And they could be, they could be somewhere that has 10 million legs that are selling to little, or they can be uh, sort of a little producer in the in the mountains who's more interested in showing you his garden than he is showing you his hams. Um, and, and that was kind of the realization hit me once I got there, the economy of scale that you need to, put, to have a quality ham business. There are a few people trying to do it in the UK, but not really on any scale that can compete with, with, with yeah. Europe. So that, that was kind of the, the idea, but then I, I sort of quickly realized um, and again, this is through travel. We, we wanted to start the business, and we never intended to start the business making traditional British products, because I, I just thought, well, the market's already rather saturated yeah. with, with producers. But it was seeing a, a sausage maker in Seattle. He'd converted, he was, he was former head librarian for Microsoft, and he decided to, 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 to leave his job to start a sausage business in his garage. And in the States, in order to have a USDA business, so a, a business where you can sell across state lines and be a relatively large-sized business and be able to do whole, wholesale meat business, um, you need to have a USDA inspector on site. So half of his garage was an office for the USDA inspector and the other half was his, was his production space. And so um, having seen that, I actually thought, well, you don't actually need a huge amount. So we invested... £2,700 in starting the business in our home kitchen. We took everything personal out of it. Yeah. And, uh, and that was our pro first processing, processing facility, making very, very traditional British products, sausages, bacons, mm -hmm. hams. Um, but but the, the vision was always to, to kind of extend from that. And, and that's what we've done. And what we see now is we, we kind of we spread across the, um, the spectrum of, of, of meat science. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we make, we make fresh sausages, bacons, cooked sausages, smoked sausages, we make all kinds of emulsifications, smoked products, um, pâtés, terrines, uh, as well as air-dried products. So we and kind of salamis. Make, we make salamis, when some will be at, at dinner tonight. Yes. So it's, uh, no, it's, an, it, it's, if somebody comes to us asking, can you make this product, it's probably a case of, well, I'm not sure if we can make it today, but give me a few days, and I can, through the building blocks of science, you can work out how, how to make that product. And so your products that come from your farm are completely different to, for example, the other Traley Meats ones, and that's from uh, charcuterie from your farm, from that place. So it's, 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 it's not just from our farm. So we, when we started, we were just producing from our own animals. Uh, and we now have about eight pork producers. So one thing they'll say is our product is really consistent when it reaches the consumer, because each of those producers has a different system. So I know for, for, for a fact, for instance, the best bacon that we produce is from a, a producer in Gower who feeds waste beer to his pigs. Um, this is something that I really struggle with because I think it's so important and it's so hard to do well. I remember um, once I spent the day, you know, I, I work mostly in our office now and on the road, uh, you know, at farms, but one day I was very excited about a batch of a small sheep's milk uh, lactic cheese and I decided I'm going to go and I'm going to stand on the cobbles in front of the burra shop and I'm going to sell it to customers and I'm going to put my cheese maker's whites on and really go communicate how amazing this cheese is to everyone who walks in the door. And I was so excited about telling the whole world, world and the whole story about like why technically this cheese was so interesting. And 
I, like, I completely bombed. Like, nobody, <laughs> you know, you could see that you most people, you no, know, people just weren't that interested. And I, and, you know, they were interested to try it and they were interested to know what chutney went with it. Oh, but when no. it came time to, but when it came time to talk about the way he was farming or the fact that the sheep had come over from France and they were adjusting to this new climate in Cumbrian, that wasn't the right environment. You're, you're absolutely right that sometimes when you're, when you're selling something to someone, you, they don't want a, uh, a, an interlude where, where they get all the details. And coming out of that experience and really feeling like it is so important to get that information available to people in the right way, my husband and I finally decided that we just had to write a book. And so we've actually written a book which synthesized a lot of the ideas that we have. And because we had 300 pages to do it in, it gave us the opportunity to put that information in a way that's accessible to a much larger group of people and allow those people to self-select and absorb that information at the right time for them. You know, it may, it may, it, not everyone's going to read the book, but at least I think giving people the opportunity to tap into multiple different channels um, is, is really important. And I completely agree with you about the, the perils of trying to do it at the wrong time. What's the name of the book? The book is uh, it's called Reinventing the Wheel, Milk, Microbes, and the Fight for Real Cheese. Oh, well, great title. And it, is it, has it been published yet? It's going to be published by University of California Press in September and by Bloomsbury here in the UK in November. So, um, <laughs> yes. And uh, just on that, do, do you know what we find uh, really kind of useful? And, and of course, I can't do it, but basically those like uh, two, three minute little YouTube things that somebody goes and, and you know, because it's visual and, and obviously and so on as well. They're, they seem to be getting a tremendous uh, that make a tremendous impact, just very short ones. And you can even show them in restaurants or something like that as well. But, um, and they, so many people are doing them now, they can even do them with iPhones and, and so on. So we've had some success with that with, on, in a different thing that we're doing. It's amazing that you say that about the cheese because exactly the same thing happened to me two weeks ago at Borough. And I was, I was talking to a customer and I could see the light dying in their eyes. And <laughs> And, and I knew that they, I'd lost that purchase. Unfortunately, Alfie, who was on the stall with me, just cut in right in front of me and got the sale. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, I just shouldn't be here because <laughs> it's it's too, it's too yeah. It's, and it's 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 interesting with 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 wholesale customers. We ask them to come to the farm because they need to understand how things are made, where they're made, so that they can pass that story on, and they can spend a morning with us, you know. And that that that's, that's fine. But and it's it's how they then distill that story onto their customer because they know how to connect with their customer. But um, but I guess yeah, it's taken. It's it's funny the 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 markets that I do in in the regular markets that I do in Cardiff, which which are kind of the ones I usually do. I have my regular customers there, so I never have to sell. I just have to turn up, and, and people come and buy things, and we have nice chats, and we know about each other's lives. But it's funny when you go to that event where you have to sell, and. Uh, I think when you're too close to something and you're too passionate about it, it's just, it turns people off. But it's, it's a skill really to distill it down into, into that. It's like, uh, there was a, um, a sort of malt and beer uh, festival in Ballymaloo last weekend and uh, somebody came along and said, there were lot, all these amazing the, the craft beer people. I mean, talk about going out off on a tangent, but anyway, uh, and so uh, somebody went off to get a beer and they somebody was launching into their, you know, all the botanicals or whatever. I said, look, I don't want to hear any of it. Just give me a beer. And, they were just, and the poor person was left there with all the, the things. But anyway, so that. I think it's it's a it's a really interesting question and it's something that's quite new to us right now. I mean, I think all of these ideas are really sort of hot off the press and rolling them out first to the cheesemongers who are the ones behind the counter and getting them comfortable with the ideas. And once they've really lived with them and they're then they'll be in a position to share them naturally when the right customer comes along. I also think it was a really in, in, interesting point though because Often we think of our audience as a company, as people who love cheese, but I think that actually by tapping into some of these themes, we could actually almost find new customers by engaging with some of these other organizations and people who already care desperately about the environment but haven't seen the way in which some of these foods, which they may not be familiar with at all, can really encapsulate a lot of the values that they already have. So I think it's a really interesting and exciting potential. Are, what are ways that we can effectively communicate 
clearly to the people who are interested without bothering people who aren't. And I think the idea of, say, for example, on our cheese counter, we have all of these tags and it says the name of the person and where, you know, where the farm is and what the name of the cheese is. But it's impossible to tell just from looking at those tags which are farmhouse cheeses, which are made by farmers who have their own animals. We could easily get a little symbol to put on the edge of the car, a little star on all of those. And, you know, maybe if you're not interested, that's fine, but it could start some interesting conversations. It could get people thinking. I actually think that's an extremely important point because that's, that's our USP. When, when the slide that Bronwyn had to do with, with artisan model, you know, the, 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 some of the companies that I compete against, they haven't done the work that we've done. You know, they haven't done the scientific work. They don't, you know, they, they, they can just buy something from a wholesaler that has a label on it and then process it into something and sell it. And that, that's, you know, they can still put a story on it, but they don't have all the other backstory that all those other foods have that have, you know, have meaning and that have a life of their own. Um, and quite often producers are probably too busy either being a farmer, being in a field with their animals, or being in a building somewhere making things to be actually doing these things. I keep on getting told by people, you should write more about this, you should tweet more about this. And all oh, that's well and good, but I just don't have the time to do that. I need to make sausages. You know, it's, it, it, it's, yeah. there, there's this balance, but it's, we're selling ourselves short by not doing it. So, yeah, I think it's, it's how we do it. I mean, I think Niels Jan is a great example that in the charcuterie industry, we don't really have it yet. You know, we don't have that body that represents us as a group of producers that, that can actually tell our story. So that, that company will come, but, but yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll take time. It's also really nice to use the thing, f um, food from this place, the, uh, you know, from this place, from this parish and so on, that to remind people it's that unique thing from this particular place, food from here. I mean, I remember years ago, I read something in the New York Times about a diner north of up in New York State that was had on the menu food from here. That was just thing. And actually, the food wasn't... I went all the way to Flipping Well Taste It, and it wasn't very good. But I was actually... The New York Times wrote about it because the menu said food from here, from that particular area and so on. And it was quite a strong selling point. <laughs> <laughs>